Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here, and I look forward to some discussion after this. So my topic is the science and the practice of resilience thinking. This term resilience is now really a common word. You hear it all over the place. It's in the newspapers, it's in organizations. We've got to make ourselves more resilient. But it's used in different ways and often very casually and it doesn't have any sense of meaning and it therefore can lose its value. It can just become another term that you can invoke and doesn't mean anything. And that would be a serious loss because the very rapid and significant changes that now all over the world that are happening, and we heard Mr. Watanabe mention some of them, they require a well-structured resilience approach. Otherwise, we will not be able to cope with what's going to happen in the future. So the key feature of resilience is that there are limits to how much a system, and that can be anything. It can be an ecosystem, a society, it can be a business, a city. It can be you, your own body. Your bodies are all complex systems. And there's a limit to how much any system can change before it can no longer recover. If your temperature goes up, it's usually about 38 degrees centigrade, if it gets up to 39 or even 40 degrees and you overcome the problem, the disease, and the temperature will go down again. Your body will self-regulate. But if you get above 41, it doesn't go back down again. It gets hotter and you die. You're in another state, but you can't get back to the live state. And that's where you cross a threshold that's irreversible. And many systems have irreversible thresholds. And so that's really a very important part of trying to understand resilience. And it's simple definition up there. It's the ability to cope with shocks and then keep functioning in much the same kind of way, to have the feedbacks that will enable you to come back and recover. A more detailed definition captures what I meant by that feedbacks and how it works. In this case, we say it's the capacity to absorb a disturbance and then to reorganize so as you retain the same function, keep functioning the same way, basically the same structure, and you have the same feedbacks which control how you're changing. And that leaves you with the same identity. And that word identity becomes a very important linking word between the different disciplines. A city can suddenly have a different identity if it changes too much and can't re-establish itself. So resilience does not mean, though, just staying the same. That's a mistake that you sometimes see in the literature. It involves changing, and it involves reorganizing. When you have a disturbance, it absorbs that disturbance and uses the disturbance so that it can keep functioning in the same kind of way in the future. It doesn't mean staying the same. But then, as I've said, there are limits to how much it can change and still recover. And those limits we call thresholds between the alternate states that a system can be in. Social scientists tend to call them tipping points. And I'm sure you've heard of the notion of crossing a tipping point where it becomes like something else. And once it's crossed, as I've said, it's very hard to get back, sometimes not possible. And they're common in all kinds of systems. And uh, just as a couple of examples, this is a coral reef. These are both coral reef systems from the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. And that's the kind of state of a coral reef that everybody loves and wants. It's full of multiple species of coral, clean seas, and lots of fish, and it's what we want. But if you put nutrients from the land, from agriculture, nitrogen, phosphorus, flows into the water, it favors algae. And if you overfish, this system. So you take out the fish that can eat algae. You're doing two things that favor algae over coral. And beyond some point, it changes. It flips into what we call this algal state. And once in that state, it is very hard to get back to the coral state. You have to wait for particular events when there's and I can't go into all the details, but much of the system stays like that. Most of the Caribbean today, 
is actually algae, not coral. And that's flipped from that state. These are two lakes in Wisconsin, and my colleague Stephen Carpenter performed an experiment on them. They both looked like that in the beginning. And then he started to add nitrogen and phosphorus and nutrients to this lake. And as he added it and added it, and they, it still looked like that one. It didn't gradually go green like this murky. It went from that suddenly to that. The next little bit of an addition of nutrients flipped it from that to that. And once it was in that state, even if you took the nutrients away, it somehow self-organized and stayed like that. It took a lot of nutrient depletion before it could go back again. This is part of my own work on rangelands. Now, that's one state that a range, these are two equivalent states very close to each other. This is an open grassy state and it's maintained like that by occasional fires. That's classic of savanna rangelands all around the world in the semi-tropics and tropics. And you can take that grass down and reduce it by grazing it with cattle up to some point and take the cattle off and then it will come back like that. But beyond some point, it goes into that state. This photograph was taken about 25 years after the herbivores, the sheep and the cattle, had been taken off, and it still looked like that. And the reason behind that is those shrubs are better at using soil water than grass. They outcompete the grass. Fire kills shrubs, but it doesn't kill grass. It just takes the surface off, and the grass comes straight back up again. Every few years, there's enough grass for a fire, so the rangeland stays in that state. Now, when I say that, that's how savannas evolved. All around the world, if you look at natural savannas, every few years, the buildup of dead grass is such that a fire will come in, lightning-induced or something, and it'll open it up and it stays in the open grassy state. But when you put cattle in and you leave them there, you can start bringing the grass down and keeping it down, and you take it away and nothing happens. Well, if shrubs increase, the grass decreases, and there's a sh threshold level of shrubs where you don't get enough grass, you can't accumulate enough for a fire that will kill shrubs. So once the rangeland crosses that threshold, that threshold level from the grassy to the shrub state, you have to reduce the amount of shrubs much below that level before you can get it back to the grassy state. And I'll show you this. I promise this is the only science-y kind of um, diagram I've got. But, so this is the rangeland, and this is the amount of grass in it, and that's the amount of shrubs in it. And the one we looked at that everybody loves is somewhere around about there. You know, lots of grass, very few shrubs. It's around about there somewhere. But as you increase the shrubs, by not allowing grass to accumulate and burn, the amount of grass that can persist there goes down and down. When it gets to about this level, it drops and it's in the shrub state. Now, when you want to come back and you say, well, we'll take all the cattle out, you have to reduce the shrubs to well below the level where it flipped before the grass will come back. And now there's all sorts of ecological and biological reasons I won't go into with how roots develop in the absence and, and with the mature roots are much better with shrubs and so forth. But there are good biological and ecological reasons why that happens. The point I want you to note is that that's in this whole space, that's a threshold level. So if you're anywhere there, the system is tending to go back to grass. And if you're anywhere there, the system is tending to go down to shrubs. So that's what these arrows mean. That threshold says, if the amount of grass, the amount of shrubs is there, that's going to get more and more grassy over time. But if it's there, just that little bit, it's going to get more and more shrubby over time. And that's internally driven by the feedbacks in the system. It's hard to understand that when you're first trying to deal with it, but that's what we saw when around the world with these threshold effects occurring in all kinds of systems. Now, just as an example, in a business, you can have the same kind of threshold. So it's a social system, but it has the same kind of system. And I'm just going to swap the names on those, those um, axes. So now we have 
instead of shrub invasion, I'm talking about the viability of a business. So that's the viability, how viable it is, and that's the debt to income ratio of a business. And anywhere here, the system will tend to remain viable. Anywhere in there, it's going to go down to a non-viable with higher debt to income ratios. So the, the viable business state and the non-viable business state are separated by a threshold again. You have to reduce the debt to income ratio far below the level that caused the plunge before the business can recover. Now any businessman will recognize something like that. And so these threshold effects and alternate states occur in all kinds of systems, ecological, social, and I could give you many more examples, but we don't have time. So virtually all systems that we know of and have looked at have at least one and often several thresholds, all of these kinds of thresholds in different kinds of systems. To begin with, we thought, oh, well, that's a kind of a special odd effect to find that threshold. But the more science has been done, the more people have looked, the more we realize that actually thresholds are common in all kinds of systems. So you cannot assume, though, that all the important thresholds are known, because otherwise you could try and manage them. Let's just take a look at one area that's really worrying a lot of people in the world. The, the United Nations governments, big corporations, are worried about what they call this looming food, water, energy nexus. The nexus means they're all coming together. If you reduce the amount of water, it has an immediate effect on how much food can produce and energy. And Professor Falkenmark is going to show us the importance of water in that relationship. But if you reduce the amount of food or you change it, it will actually affect water, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively because of other side effects. And energy is, needs water. So this complex system has a number of interactions. But when you look at it like that, that's not enough. Because that system, those links in that system, are embedded in a much more complex system. Climate change has effects on energy, water, and food separately. Refugees, war, and terrorism will affect water and it'll affect wood, um, food. We have rising resistance to antibiotics now and new diseases appearing. They will affect food strongly. Economic shocks will. So if you look at all of those and you look at all of those interactions, it's impossible to predict the outcome of any particular change you make in it. There are 42 connections just in that system. So if you changed that arrow, the effect of economic shocks on energy, you could not predict the outcome for climate change or water or antibody, or in, and yet they're all connected. So that's a complex adaptive system. And a complex adaptive system is inherently unpredictable to any particular intervention. So what do you do? Well, the only way to deal with that is to build general resilience, to make the whole system generally resilient to any kind of disturbance or interference. So what are the attributes that confer resilience in general? And the first one, and very important that I'll talk about, is diversity the different things in a system. But there are two kinds of diversity, and I want to emphasize this point because functional diversity everyone understands. In an ecosystem, you have trees and shrubs and deep-rooted ones and shallow-rooted ones, and you have insects and you have herbivores and you've got all sorts of, you have pollinators that pollinate all of the, sea, all of the trees. So you have all of these different functional groups of organisms that must be there for the system to continue functioning. So that's functional diversity. But then we talk about response diversity. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, think of an ecosystem, anyone, a grassland, a forest. One of the functions that an ecosystem has to have is the ability to fix nitrogen from the air. Nitrogen doesn't occur as a mineral in soil, so you've got to keep fixing it. And the things that fix nitrogen are legume species, beans, peas, and not society, but many kinds. Acacia trees are legumes in savannas. You have to have legume species to fix the nitrogen. Now, if the system 
has one species of legume. As long as nothing happens to it, that ecosystem will continue to fix nitrogen. The nitrogen fixation process will continue that function. But if a disease or some drought or a very high temperature effect kills that species, you lose nitrogen function and the system will change dramatically. It'll become a different kind. If you have 10 legume species, whatever kinds of disturbance hits that ecosystem, at least some of them are very likely to keep going. And that's what we call response diversity. You have 10 species that all do the same thing. They all fix nitrogen, but they do it in different ways and they respond differently to environmental disturbances of different kinds. And having response diversity is a key attribute for being resilient. I emphasize this, and I'll probably say it again, because that's what is being eliminated in many systems today under this urge to make things more efficient. In a business, people say, why do we need 10 ways of doing this? Let's just find the one that's doing it best and get rid of all the others, they're redundant. Well, in many cases, it's not redundancy they're getting rid of. It's response diversity and they're reducing resilience. The second one I want to talk about is variability. And I say this as probe the boundaries is the summary. A child who's been brought up and is always protected from playing in dirt and never allowed to play in the dirt and is kept clean all the time, grows up with a compromised immune system and then suffers from all sorts of allergies later in life. The only way for a child to grow up resilient to the environment it lives in is to be exposed to that environment. It has to get the odd cold and have the odd scratch and itch. You don't let it go beyond a threshold where it dies, but you've got to probe the boundaries to develop an appropriate immune system. So if you have a, a forest and you never ever burn it, you protect the forest from burning, the species that are capable of withstanding fire will eventually be outcompeted by all the other species. And then if a fire does come, the whole forest is lost. So the only way to keep a forest resilient to fire is to burn it every now and then. And people find that sometimes hard to understand. But the message is probe the boundary. Whoops, I keep hitting the wrong one, as I've said. Well, having done that, I don't have enough time to go through all the rest. But these are all attributes of diversity, that are of our resilience, that have been illustrated and shown in various studies. Having reserves is a very important one. Um, ecosystems that have roots underground with lots of stu food stored are very resilient. Um, countries that have lots of financial reserves are more resilient. So reserves of all kinds add resilience. This modularity means how connected is the system. A system that's fully connected, all the bits are completely connected to each other. If something bad strikes that system, like a very bad idea, or a disease comes in, it'll spread straight through the whole system quickly, and it'll be very disastrous. If you don't have any connectivity, or very little, then anything that you need to help with within the system as a whole is strongly restricted by not being connected enough. So therefore, you need some kind of modular system. And how much? We don't know. It depends on the system, and you've always got to ask, is it sufficiently connected or not sufficiently connected? But we know that some degree of modularity is needed. Now, having tight feedbacks, that's the response time is in, in a way like response diversity. How quickly can you respond to a disturbance? Social capital is very important, and there's been many studies, and what they show collectively is that trust, good social networks, and leadership are the three attributes that really confer social capital, that make a social system resilient. Innovation and learning, and I'm, this is really important because it's been shown so many times that if you encourage innovation and learning and a big disturbance occurs, the system can figure out new ways of doing things and they have stored new ways and they survive. 
and I put here versus subsidies to continue doing the same thing that's not working. All too often, people don't like change. And so when they want help from the government, they want help to keep doing the thing that wasn't working in the first place. So government should definitely give help, but they should get help to change, not help not to change, which is the most common feature. The adaptive and distributed or overlapping governance. This is really an important thing again, because if you make any kind of region has different levels of governance. You've got a national, you've got a regional, and then you've got some state, you've got very local governance. You can have um, prefectures, I believe, you would call them in Japan, but they've got governance at different scales. And at each level, there are appropriate decisions that should be made at that level. But according to circumstances, the appropriate level can change. In terms of a major crisis, the decision should probably be taken at the highest level. You've all got to conform and do the same thing or it's going to fall apart. But for most efficient and optimal use of the whole system and being able to respond easily, you often need it at much finer scales. The Nobel economist Eleanor Ostrom got her Nobel Prize for working on what she called this adaptive and distributed and overlapping governance. I don't have time to go to, into it in the detail, but if, for those of you who are interested and want to look it up, there's a huge literature on this, and it's a very difficult thing to get right in reality, because people are people, and the problem is that once decisions have moved up to a higher scale, the higher scale very seldom wants to allow them to come back down again. They want to keep control. And so how you overcome that, you have to have it sort of a built-in requirement. Now, these last two are in italics because the book that I wrote with a colleague of mine on resilience thinking, at the end of it, we challenged readers to let us know if there were any other attributes that they thought were important. And we got a lot of responses. It was fun reading through them all. And we put them into different groups. And the two main areas that fell out of this, one, they said, really, systems that are more fair and that are more equitable and don't have high inequity, are inherently more resilient. And you can think about that. This isn't based on any research that I know of or published. These are ideas. And the other one I found really interesting was humility. Being able to be a bit humble and not think you know everything and how to do it. So humility. Now, I won't spend more time, but these are the attributes that confer and promote resilience in general in any system. I want to go on now just to illustrate, make sure that I leave you with some important points and that emphasize what resilience is and it isn't because this is in relation to this common use of the word nowadays. And resilience as such is not good or bad. Mostly people think resilience is good. You've got to build resilience. Well, an evil dictatorship is very resilient. A salinized landscape is very resilient. The desertified Sahel is very resilient, and those are not good states. So it's just an attribute of a system, whether it can be easily changed or not, and how it can recover. And resilience is not the ability to bounce back. You'll often read that in the literature, and that implies that you change it, and it comes back to exactly what it was. It bounces back to the same state. It isn't. It's the ability to change while coping with disturbance, this reorganizing part. You learn from the disturbance and reorganize so that you adapt to be able to deal with it in the future. So it's not about not changing or preventing disturbance. Keeping a system constant reduces its resilience. You cannot understand or manage resilience on any system at one scale. The tendency is to say, this is where the problem is. The, the, scale, the problem I'm interested in occurs at this local scale, scale of a farm or a, a township or something like that. Or, no, this problem I'm interested in is at this big scale of the state or the region. And so you focus on that scale and analyze it and try to understand it. But no system operates at one scale. It has embedded scales, and it is embedded in scales above. And the cross-scale connections and effects are very often what determine the resilience of the scale that you're interested in. And so overcoming this 
urge to keep just looking at the one scale where the problem is, is a big mistake. Most losses in resilience are the consequences of this narrowly focused optimization. I've mentioned before the efficiency drives. That's very narrow and it's a, it's a misplaced use of the word optimization. And this then relates to my next point, which is that managing and building resilience does come at a cost. It means accepting some inefficiencies, having several ways of doing the same thing, and all too often they call redundancies. When you fly in a big aircraft these days, Boeing were the first to invent them, there are five operating systems in that Boeing. And they've all been designed by different groups in some ways. They all do the same thing. They keep the thousands of bits that there are in an airplane operating so that the plane stays in the air. But if that operating system should fail, one of the next one clicks in. And if it fails, the third one clicks in. They all have to do the same operating system, but they do it in slightly different ways and they can respond. Aircraft manufacturers cannot afford to let an aircraft fall out the sky because the operating system failed. So they build in what they call redundancy. They build in what I call response diversity. They have to pay for it. But very often, if you think you can get away with it and you have an efficiency drive, you tend to get rid of it. In applying resilience, the task really is not about trying to choose where to go, some particular future, and say, that's what we've got to do. It's really about choosing where not to go. It's about avoiding these thresholds or tipping points into unwanted states and parts of other systems. There is a whole developing area of research now called guided self-organization. And it means really that you let the system self-organize into the future, but in a guided way so that you prevent it from going into very disastrous states. That's where you really intervene. But it's sort of guiding the self-organization. It's very different to many ways of thinking. In much of the world today, existing systems are failing. And the need is not to make them more resilient. The need is for them to be transformed into some different kind of system. It, I've come across this so strongly in research that no help that we've been trying to do. In the Sahel in Africa, much of the existing systems of agriculture locally have failed and they're not working. It's no good trying to make them more resilient. That's like the old statement of digging the hole deeper. You make it worse. You have to find a different way of making a living and of using the land. What determines transformability, the ability to transform? Three critical things. The first one is getting past the state of denial, accepting that, in fact, it's no longer tenable to keep doing what we're doing. In much of the world today, with the big feature of climate change, big multi-corporate corporations and many governments are in a state of denial. They refuse to accept that climate change is real and that they think we can carry on because the short-term costs are just too horrible for them to think about. The second, once you've got past that state of denial, is identifying options. And some of those options exist. They occur in related similar systems elsewhere, or you, you just haven't used them, or no, but they're known. And some have to be created. You have to do experimentation. In the Netherlands, there's a program called um, DRIFT. It's a, resilience for future change, but it's about, they call it transitioning. And what they do is they promote small experiments of doing different things in agriculture, in water reform. They don't do it at a big scale, where if it failed, it would be a disaster. They do it at a safe, small scale. Most of the experiments fail, but the ones that succeed will gradually expand and spread. And that's a good way of trying to define new options. It also requires support from higher levels. And as I've said, you need the help to change rather than the help not to change. Australia today, we have a lot of droughts and they're getting more frequent. And when there's a big drought, the farmers scream for help. And the government gives them what they call drought relief. And they pay them out so that when the drought's over, they can go back to doing the same thing. In fact, what they should be doing is saying, right, 
here's some money to help you change from doing the kind of rangeland management or farming you were doing to do something different because the one you're doing is not working anymore. I won't go into the details of what it is you can do. So the big question I think that confronts much of the world today, and I'm sure this would be in Japan as well as anywhere else, is where is there a need to build resilience? Because it's the kind of system that you want and you need it and it needs to be, and you just need to make it more resilient. And where is there a need for transformational change? where you really have to undertake a transfer. That's the hard part. But you've got to ask that question before you start interfering. And where do you interfere? Where and when to intervene and manage resilience? And a useful guide for this that's emerged is this notion of the adaptive cycle. And there are four phases in this metaphor. And the first one is growth. So you could think of that as a new business starting out, and it starts out very nimble, it's got very few people, and you can do all sorts of things, and it's, it's, it's highly flexible, and it can adapt and move forward, and it's very resilient. A new ecosystem starting out on a bare area would be the same. New species coming in, lots of available resources, and you can have more species as, you, as they move in. But over time, this develops into what we call a conservation phase. Things become more rigid. In the ecosystem, most of the material is locked up in, in wood or in litter or very hard to change. No species can come in. In a business, they get really rigid and you can't bring in innovation and you can't change. There are all sorts of rules and tight controls and so forth. It becomes less and less resilient. And then something will cause a release phase and, and some big it's a small disaster in the end. The longer it stays in this phase, the smaller the little disaster needed, and then it all releases. And the nutrients flow out of the system, species disappear, half the business collapses, and lots of it is lost. So it's a loss phase. But very quickly it goes into a reorganization phase. If it doesn't, then the whole thing is lost. But assuming that there's enough left, it goes into a reorganization phase. And Oh, yes, okay. So <laughs> this forward phase, this is what we call the fall loop, going from the growth to the conservation. And it is predictable and it's slow. It takes a long time. This back loop that we call is very fast and it's unpredictable and people don't study it. All the studies you see of in systems are to do with this part of the predictable part of a system. So as I say, it's slow and it's fairly predictable. This is fast and unpredictable. And in fact, that phase is completely chaotic. There's no prediction at all. So these are both internal processes. They're self-organizing. The, the outside world can stay completely constant. And the internal processes that drive the system will cause it to go through to there and to there. But what triggers it is external. Some kind of external shock or change in conditions will trigger the collapse of the conservation into the release phase. An important point here, why I wanted to emphasize it, is that this collapse that triggers the shift to this release is often a crisis opportunity for making a very difficult change. In many cases, you cannot make the change under the normal conditions. It has to be a chaotic system before you allow to make the change. It's brief, and if you're not ready for it, and if you haven't thought about the changes you need, then you'll have lost the opportunity to make those necessary changes. So being prepared and ready to make use of crises, that's a very important part of transformability, which is really what we're talking about in that system. I have some examples, but I think I might be running out of time. So I'm going to leave you with these four resilience messages. The first one is embrace change and uncertainty. The urge and the kind of normal dictum of trying to be absolutely sure you know what you're doing, get rid of the uncertainties, understand, is actually against the long-term notion of resilience. Expect the unexpected. Embrace uncertainty. Build systems that are going to be safe 
when they fail. Expect failure rather than trying to build a fail-safe system. And engineers find that really hard to deal with. An engineer who builds a bridge to withstand a one in a thousand year flood does so with a particular probability distribution of floods. But if a one in 10,000 year flood comes along and washes the bridge away, the engineer says, well, that's not my fault. I built it to withstand a one in a thousand year flood, which is true. But in fact, what they're trying to do is, is build a fail-safe system within defined limits. What a resilience approach would say, assume the bridge is going to fail. Now, how could you make the whole operating part of that system work still? And believe it or not, there are engineers and places and cities where they have this who are now thinking of really cheap, easily transportable floating bridges that you can put into place very quickly as a response diversity and you don't assume that the system won't fail. Learn how to ride the system, finding adaptive pathways. What I said about guided self-organization. Don't try and fix on a particular route and say, that's where we want to be. That's the best possible state to be. Because when you say that, it depends on the fact that all the rest of the whole environment will stay as it is for that to be the best state. And sure as eggs are not, when you say that's going to be the best state, Next week it isn't anymore because the world has changed. So learn how to ride the system. Keep it flexible. Find adaptive pathways into the future. And my final point is be ready for these opportunities that crises provide. Be ready to intervene when they do. Thank you very much.